Hey everyone, Dr. Michael Carey here, and today we're going to begin looking at the fifth trumpet judgment from Revelation and answer the question, what is the bottomless pit and where did it come from? Also, if you missed the last video, be sure to go back and watch it, and while you're at it, make sure to hit the subscribe button and then click the notification bell so that you don't miss a single video post. You know, I've had a lot of people ask, and yes, we are a listener-supported ministry, and you can find out more about the ministry and how you can stand with us by visiting our website that's on the bottom corner of the screen. Now, let's just jump right into our topic at hand. We've been talking about the seven trumpet judgments in Revelation and how there is a succession of divine judgment during the tribulation that the Bible depicts as the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls that are described throughout the Bible as the wrath of the Lamb. And that the most common perspective among theologians is that each judgment is the catalyst for the next and that the wrath of God becomes more and more severe as they progress. Now, for a bit of context, this is all part of the same prophetic revelation that John saw beginning in Revelation 4 as he was caught up through a spiritual doorway into the throne room of heaven. And during this vision, he saw the things that would take place after the rapture of the church. Now in Revelation 5 and Revelation 6, John saw Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, take the seven-sealed scroll from the Father's hand and open the first six seals that released the Antichrist and the other horses of the apocalypse and began or set off an unprecedented judgment on this earth. In Revelation 7, John saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth and another angel carrying the seal of God, calling out to these four angels, instructing them to hold back any further judgment at this point of the tribulation for a short season. And then, in some way, the ministry of these angels, it results in the salvation of the 144,000 Jewish witnesses or 144,000 Jewish evangelists who then proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout Israel, the surrounding area, and the entire world, leading to quite possibly the greatest harvest of souls that we have ever seen come in. Now, in Revelation 8, the seventh seal is opened, and this is really an incredible scene because up until this moment, there's been constant movement, there's been constant praise in the throne room, and suddenly all of heaven goes silent, I believe, to allow the prayers of the tribulation saints who are now suffering under the weight of incredible persecution as the Antichrist has risen to greater and greater power to be heard throughout heaven and to emphasize the significance about what's to take place in this second half of the tribulation. And then, as the first trumpet sounds, it sets off a, a chain of judgments, each preceded by the sound of a trumpet from heaven, which throws the entire earth into chaos and even destroys the high spiritual stronghold of a very powerful demonic principality named Wormwood, casting him down to the earth. Now, we talked about this at length in my last video on the first four trumpet judgments, which brings us to Revelation 9 and the fifth trumpet judgment. Now, let's dive into our topic for the day. Revelation 9, verse 1 through 3 says this, Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace, so that the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke from the pit. Now, remember, wormwood is a who and not a what. 
and that this same demonic principality who fell in the chapter right before is now fallen and is seen again right here in our text. Now, I've heard a lot of people say that they don't believe that God would give the key to the bottomless pit to a fallen angel. But referring to a godly angel as a star fallen from heaven to earth doesn't actually make sense. According to Revelation 1 verse 18, Jesus declares that he has the keys of absolute control and victory over both hell and death. Revelation 3, 7 tells us that Christ has the authority to open and close spiritual doors that cannot be opened or closed without his permission. And in Matthew 28, 18, Jesus declared that all authority in heaven and on earth belongs to him. My point being that if God is in absolute control and has absolute authority, the truth is the key doesn't fit anything except the bottomless pit, and this fallen angel wormwood can't do anything outside of what God allows anyway, so why not? Now, the phrase bottomless pit, this is really interesting, is more accurately translated as abyss. And if you go back to the Old Testament and look at the Hebrew word for abyss, it refers to the formless void that existed before the six days of creation in Genesis. In fact, let's take a little bit of time and look at that. Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2 says this, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, indulge me for a few minutes because what I'm about to share with you is not only interesting, but it's completely relevant to what we're talking about. Now, the phrase without form and void depicts an emptiness and a desolation of something that was destroyed and even depopulated. See, it's not just talking about something that's empty. It's talking about something that's empty now. It's talking about something that had something there but was destroyed, and the word itself even leads itself towards the concept of depopulated. So that passage could actually read that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, but see, Clearly, something happened in between Genesis 1, verse 1, and Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Because when you get to verse 2, the entire earth is submerged in water and is now being described as formless and void. Why? Because God destroyed it. Now, a lot of biblical scholars believe that there could, be, that there could have been a tremendous amount of time between these two verses and that this could actually account for the dinosaurs and other creatures that we've only found in the fossil records of the earth. And that it was during this time, uh, in between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2, that Lucifer was cast out of heaven and down to earth. Now, amazingly, the Apostle Peter talks about this pre-Adamic flood. See, we know about the flood of Noah, but there was a pre-Adamic flood that was found uh, th th that Peter talks about in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 4 through 7. In fact, let me show that to you. It says this, They will say, where is this coming that he promised? Talking about the Lord, right? That we're talking about rebellion on this earth. Now, ever since our ancestors di have died, everything goes on as, as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget, they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. And now in verse six, it says this, by these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed by the same word, the present heavens and earth, are reserved for fire being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. 
And we know that Peter isn't talking about the flood of Noah because the flood of Noah didn't leave the earth void void or or formless, and there wasn't any act of creation that was needed after it. On top of that, the context of this passage in 2 Peter 2 is the beginning of creation, and he says that the world of that time, or the time of the beginning of creation, was formed out of the water and then later was completely destroyed by water, which was the judgment that brought about the emptiness and the absolute desolation that we see in the first half of Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. Now, what I'm about to say is a bit theologically philosophical. I believe that the bottomless pit or the abyss is the physical and spiritual byproduct of this judgment by God that took place in Genesis chapter 1, somewhere between verse 1 and verse 2, and it's marked by an absolute darkness. But it's interesting to note that when God's anger subsided, that the Spirit of God began to hover over the earth, and the very first thing that God said in creation was, let there be light. Now, talking about this same account uh, and talking about God in creation, the Gospel of John in chapter 1 says this, in him was life and the life, talking about God, the life of God was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it, which creates actually a bit of an enigma or a paradox, because according to the Apostle John, the darkness from Genesis 1-2 still exists, but it's completely powerless against the light of God's life that has continued to shine since the moment that God said, let there be light, when his presence at that time pushed that darkness away from the earth and created the bottomless pit, which is somehow connected now to the deepest parts of hell. And according to Revelation 9-11, this darkness has become a prison for fallen angels and supernatural creatures, as well as the king over these fallen angels named Abaddon or Apollyon. Interestingly, the word abyss is also translated as the abode of demons in the New Testament. Check this out. In Luke chapter 8, we find the account of Jesus casting the demons out of the man from the region of the Gadarenes. And it says, Then they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when he, talking about Jesus, stepped out on the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. And he wore no clothing, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice says, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demons into the wilderness. Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him, and they begged him. Now, this is really interesting. And they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. So these demonic spirits who called themselves legion literally begged Jesus not to cast them into the abyss or the bottomless pit because they were absolutely terrified of it. Now, let's pick up our text again in Revelation 9-2. It says this, And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. So when the abyss or the bottomless pit is opened, it immediately begins to darken our sky with a steady stream of smoke, which again means that we're not talking about something figurative or symbolic. See, a lot of scholars throughout the ages have believed that this is all 
figurative language, but I don't believe that. I believe we, we are not talking about something figurative. We're not talking about something symbolic. We're talking about a very real place, and we're talking about a very real spiritual door that's opened with a very real spiritual key. And the fact that all these things come from the spirit realm doesn't make them any less real. The truth is, at this point of revelation, these things actually breach the veil that separates the natural from the supernatural. And I am absolutely convinced that this doorway into the bottomless pit will have an actual location and will be visible to anyone who goes there. In fact, at this very moment, there are all kinds of demonic beings and angelic creatures that are already imprisoned there. Now, let's talk about that for a few minutes because uh, 2 Peter 2, verse 4 through 5 says this, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned... Now, he's talking about the angels who sinned back in Genesis chapter 6 but he cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness. Now, that's interesting that the chains are chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. See, I believe that the spirits in this place are the same demonic spirits that led to a near total corruption of humanity resulting in the flood of Noah and the destruction of every living being on earth outside of those that were preserved on the ark, both human and animal. See, in Genesis 6, there was an unbelievable amount of demonic corruption that spread across the earth. And it started with a group of fallen angels who genetically corrupted both the human and animal gene pools. And even further, these fallen angels were so wicked and influential on the earth that all but eight people on the earth had lost the knowledge of righteousness and were evil in every intent and action before God. In fact, Genesis 6, 9 through 12 says this. And I encourage you to really, really take in what it says. It says, this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God, and Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh has corrupted their way on the earth. See, it's right there in the Word of God, but it's so easy to miss because most people, when they read the Bible, they see the word genealogy and then just gloss over everything that comes after it for a little while, right? And I mean, you know what I'm talking about. When you're reading the Word and all of a sudden it says, and so and so begat, and so and so begat, and they were the son of, all of a sudden you just kind of glaze over, right? And But what it tells us in this account is that the whole earth had become corrupted except for Noah, who was righteous before God and was free from genetic corruption in his generations. Now, what, that, what does that actually mean? That means he was free from this corruption in his bloodline. And I said all of that because I believe that these are the very same fallen angels along with their perverted, angelic, hybrid creations that are locked in the bottomless pit right now and will be released during the fifth trumpet judgment in Revelation. Now, you might have passed right over this, but Jesus describes this in Luke 17, 26, when he talked about the things that would take place right before his second coming, which is at the very end of the tribulation. And he says something very disturbing in the greater context of what we've been talking about. Jesus says, as it was, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be also in the days of the Son of Man, which aligns perfectly with the sounding 
of the fifth trumpet judgment that we're talking about. Now, let's start to wrap this up. Revelation 9, verse 3 through 5 says this, Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads, and they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. So as the bottomless pit be, uh, opens and begins to belch out this hellish smoke, a demonic horde of creatures ascend from the smoke and they are so numerous that they are initially described by John as a horde of locusts coming out of this pit. Now, this prophetic scene is incredibly unsettling because these creatures are coming directly from a part of hell that even the demons who called themselves legion were terrified of. Now, we're talking about an apocalyptic nightmare, and I don't know any other way to describe it, that eclipses anything that Hollywood could possibly imagine. I mean, can you imagine the terror that's going to come on people in this world where more than one-third of everyone who was left behind after the rapture of the church have died from famine, they've died from war, they've been struck with disease, and an entire chain of supernatural events, and now a horde being described as locust, a horde of demon locust, literally ascend onto this earth out of this pit that was opened by a fallen angel. Now, these things should stir something in our spirit that drives us to live very responsive to the urgings of the Holy Spirit as we interact with the world around us. See, we are living in a time of grace, and I'm telling you this because you need to get it in your spirit. We do not have the time in this world this world around us is dying. This world around us is lost. We need to be responsive to the Spirit, and we need to recognize that these days are pressing in on us and that there's nothing left that needs to be fulfilled for the rapture of the church, meaning that there is nothing that needs to be fulfilled prophetically before these events begin to take place except the rapture of the church and this should stir in us a love for the world around us like we've never had before. 2 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2 says this, We strongly urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says at the acceptable time of grace, I listened to you and I helped you in the day of salvation. Behold, now, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. See, this dispensation of grace that we're living in is a window in time where God in his mercy and goodness is calling out to the entire world and we are admonished not to waste a single moment of it. We need to be people led by the Spirit. We need to be people who are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because we know the things that are coming to those that are left behind. Now, let's stop there for this video. In our next session, we're going to get more into this trumpet judgment. But before you go today, I want to pray one of the most beautiful prayers in all the Bible over your life. It's called the ironic blessing. Let's pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Father, I ask right now that wherever people are, whatever they're facing, whatever they're going through, that God, that your goodness, that your mercy, that your favor, God, would shine on them, it would shine upon their families, and it would shine directly into any area of need within their life. 
And Lord, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless, and I look forward to seeing you next time.